Hey everyone, this is Adam Ellenboss from Nightlight Astrology. Happy Monday, everybody. Today we are going to take yet another look at Venus's upcoming retrograde in the sign of Leo. And we're going to be looking in particular at the tension that is present between the themes of independence and dependence uh, with this upcoming transit. And the reason for that is that Venus is the goddess of relationship, while the sun, remember Venus is in Leo, which is the sign of the sun. So the sun is the natural symbol for individuality, purpose, the heroic journey of the self. These are all themes that have long been related to the sun. And so the potential for a, the, a, an archetypal tension or tug of war between the themes of independence, heroic independence, and romance and dependence uh, are, are a big possibility for this upcoming retrograde. So we're going to look at that today. That is our goal. Before we do so, don't forget to like and subscribe. Share your comments in the comments section. I'd love to hear your insights and reflections um, as we go. And not only now, but as the retrograde unfolds, it'd be cool to see you come back to this video, listen to it again maybe, and drop a comment as it's all unfolding. Uh, if you want to find a transcript of today's talk, you can find it on my website, nightlightastrology.com, where you can also check out all of my courses and readings. If you have any questions about any of that, email me, info at nightlightastrology.com. Now, many of you know that in the new year, we're going to be starting a donation-based reading clinic, which will expand our reading services and offer more affordable services and also services that you don't have to wait as long for, because currently my wait time is about a year. In the meantime, we get a lot of questions from people saying, who would you recommend if I don't want to wait a year and your donation clinic isn't up and running yet? Well, this week, I'm going to be promoting uh, a friend of mine, Amanda Pua Walsh and her company, which is called Astrology Hub and a new service that they have that I think is really cool. So I'm going to tell you about that today. Uh, if you want to learn more about it, the simple thing to do is to go over to their website, which is astrologyhub.com. I'm going to take you there right now. Once you go to astrologyhub.com, first of all, check out their whole website. I have worked for them before and taught for them before and been on their podcast before. Um, and many of the people who work for Astrology Hub are friends and colleagues of mine, and I, I love what they do. I love the diverse uh, approach that they take. They, have, they host a lot of different astrologers from a lot of different backgrounds and schools of astrology. They have a lot of interesting programs that they run throughout the year and classes and so on and so forth. But what I want to point you to in particular is their new reading service. So if you go to the readings tab and click on it, you'll be taken over to their Astrologer Connect service. And this the reason that I want to promote this is not only because I, I love them and I love what they're doing and I want to support them anytime that, they, that they're looking to promote something new. I've uh, helped promote their programs in the past that I participated in and so forth. But because I have so many people every week emailing saying, I'd love to get a reading with you. Your wait time is a little far out. What, you know, is there something you would recommend that's, that's quicker? Who would you recommend that I can get in quicker with? Well, um, you know, up until now, I haven't had something that I, I just, okay, this astrologer, that astrologer, whatever. Like, you know, I know, I know lots of astrologers, so I can, I can point out some names. But what I, what I love about this service and the reason I want to promote it this week is because the way that they've organized this is really unique. First of all, if you go to the Astrologer Connect portion of Astrology Hub and scroll down, what you're going to find is that you can, you can focus in on the type of reading you want to get and be placed with a reader based on the topic that you want help with and the kinds of astrologers that and what they tend to be good at or what they tend to specialize in, which is really, really cool. I think I think I, I love that. And, you know, maybe someday we'll even use something like that on, on our site, too. I just I love the way they've done that. Anyway, you go down a little bit and you can meet all of the astrologers on staff. I will tell you right now that I, I know and friends with and have worked with a number of people on staff. And some of them have even come through and studied in programs or classes that have uh, been hosted at Nightlight. Some of them have taught at Nightlight. Uh, so anyway, you can look through the staff there. I have spoken with people on the staff on panels. I've traveled with some of these people in India. I've, you know, so I, I really, really can't say enough about the quality of astrologers that they've gathered together for their staff here that you can connect with. Now, I don't know all of them, but I know a lot of them. And what I also like is that you can learn, so you can click on any of their profiles and learn more about it. Like here's Joe. You could learn more about Joe and what he's all about as an astrologer, which is super cool. Um, but I also like that you could do a quiz. So you can take a quiz and find who you want to match with. Um, okay, let's say I want to be matched with a male astrologer. I don't have a preference for time zone. I'm a pro astrologer. Uh, yes, there's something very specific I need clarity on. Let's say it's sole purpose. 
which statement best describes the way you navigate your life and make decisions. And you've got some really interesting options. I consider, I equally consider both the data logic and my heart or gut knowing. And I'll just skip this. And then I get matched with the astrologer that based on my answers, uh, you know, that matches with me best. So that's Gemini Brett, which is so funny to me because Gemini Brett has taught in my programs before. He's a friend, he's a colleague, and his approach is one I definitely resonate with. Just in terms of the way he, his, his heart and he's equally like sort of logic and heart centered. And I really like that about him. I could easily do this over, pick some different options, and I'm sure that I would get something else. But when I took this right away and I just zoned in and I was like, let's see, let's see how good they do. It matched me with someone right away that I was like, that's, that's pretty cool that they came up with this way of matching people um, with, with readers. Anyway, there's some other cool features that I really like. Um, I'm going to be having Amanda on the show this week to talk with me about Astrologer Connect and how you can get more and, you know, how you can sign up. Um, there's also a promo code that I'll be giving you guys here at the end so that if you want a book, you can save 15% off if you use a promo code that they've given um, my YouTube audience, which is pretty cool. Anyway, what's also cool about this is that you can look and see, for example, Shannon Gill, who I know I've hung out with her and her husband a few times before at conferences, really nice people, great astrologers. Um, she's actually online right now. So some of these um, astrologers will have this green little phone thing that's online, which means you could literally connect with them live at, like, at that time, it's sort of like they're on call, they're there ready to talk. When you book, it's pretty cool too, because you could book, for example, um, you could pick date, video call, the reading length, and different lengths and prices and stuff like that. Um, there's options also for text message or phone or Zoom, um, and you can do it by the minute or by hour. So it's very, it's super flexible, and I like that because sometimes you can really get a lot done with like 10 minutes. I mean, I know, for example, that I do, I, I've done 10 minute rapid readings throughout my entire career. You can get a lot done in 10 minutes. You could have an hour long reading. So I think this is really going to meet people where they're at and it makes me feel really good to have something that I can refer people to so that, you know, it's like, I would love if you would wait a year for a, a reading with me, you know, and, I, and, I, and people do. And I'm, that's why I stay booked out. And I'd like to think that's because I'm good at what I do, you know, but, <laughs> but it's also like, I want to be able to have something really reliable and trusting, trustworthy that I can refer people to. And so when I found out about this service, I was just really excited to help promote them uh, in what they're doing, uh, not only because I like what they're doing, but I really believe in all, all of Astrology Hub's work because I've been a part of it and I've gotten to know them and know where their hearts are coming from. And I really think it's coming from the right place. And uh, there's other things that you can check out. Like they have, I'll just, I'll just show you this really quick. I'm kind of doing a long, big promo today. I'll be promoting it the rest of the week, but this is kind of the big treatment at, here at the beginning of the week. You can go to their podcast, the Astrology Hub podcast. I've been on that podcast before. It's wonderful. They have a lot of diverse topics and guests. The Astrology Hub podcast is on YouTube as well. You can find them on Facebook at the um, at the at Astrology Hub too. So there's you know lots of ways that you can connect with them and see the broader body of work that they that they do. And I'll be very glad to collaborate with them again in the future. So anyway, you'll be, and you'll get to meet Amanda later this week because she'll be coming on uh, my podcast to talk about the service as well. Okay, so thank you guys very much for letting me promote that. I hope that it's useful to you guys. You'll find some good use out of it. Today, I want to talk with Venus's upcoming retrograde in the sign of Leo. I want to talk about some of the shadows of the sun that can sneak in and that we might see Venus working with over the course of this Venus retrograde. And it really brings up the tension between individuality and dependency or independence versus dependence. I want to read you something <clears throat> that is coming from a book that Ashley and I are reading. We read over the years, especially, and I think you guys know this, I've told this story like a million times now, but prior to us having kids, we had a practice of prayer, meditation, um, you know, gardening and, um, and uh, reading books and stuff like that and taking walks. Our morning time was like our sacred marital ritual time. And then kids came along and it was like, well, <laughs> like, see you in a few years, <laughs> but it's been good. <laughs> and so now we've been getting back to that. The kids are a little bit older, like they're more capable of taking care of themselves in the morning. So we have our morning rituals back. So we've been reading again. We read this book I told you guys about recently called uh, Adult Children of Emotionally Immature Parents, which was super fascinating, really interesting for both of us. We started a new book recently called Attached. 
uh, the new science of adult attachment and how it can help you find and keep love. Now, um, this is was recommended to us by another. We have um, another couple friend of ours that were they were in our in our wedding and um, they've read this and they're in their marriage and they, it's been really nice for them to read together. They were talking about it with us. We're like, oh, we'll, we'll check that out. I'm really loving this so far. Ashley and I are both really enjoying this book. It's it's very fascinating. It's filled with things that I think a lot of people could benefit from, like reading if you're if you're into the that kind of stuff. Anyway, there's a section I want to read today that is perfectly appropriate for Venus's upcoming retrograde in Leo, and it starts with a section called the codependency myth. Here it goes. The codependency movement and other currently popular self-help approaches portray relationships in a way that is remarkably similar to the views held in the first half of the 20th century about the child-parent bond. Remember, the happy child who is free of unnecessary attachments. Today's experts offer advice that goes something like this. Your happiness is something that should come from within and should not be dependent on your lover or mate. Your well-being is not their responsibility, and theirs is not yours. Each person needs to look after himself or herself. In addition, you should learn not to allow your inner peace to be disturbed by the person you're closest to. If your partner acts in a way that undermines your sense of security, you should be able to distance yourself from the situation emotionally. Quote, keep the focus on yourself and stay on an even keel. If you can't do that, there might be something wrong with you. You might be too enmeshed with the other person or codependent, and you must learn to set better, quote, boundaries. The basic premise underlying this point of view is that the ideal relationship is one between two self-sufficient people who unite in a mature, respectful way while maintaining clear boundaries. If you develop a strong dependency on your partner, you are deficient in some way and are advised to work on yourself to become more differentiated they could easily have used the word individuated, and develop a greater sense of self. The worst possible scenario is that you will end up needing your partner, which is equated with addiction to them, and addiction, we all know, is a dangerous prospect. While the teachings of the codependency movement remain immensely helpful in dealing with family members who suffer from substance abuse, they can be misleading and even damaging when applied indiscriminately to all relationships. <clears throat> And here is a next section that says the biological truth. Numerous studies show that once we become attached to someone, the two form one physiological unit. Our partners regulate our blood, our blood pressure, our heart rate, our breathing, and the level of hormones in our blood. We are no longer separate entities. The emphasis on differentiation, or again, you could say individuation, that is held by most of today's popular psychology approaches to adult relationships does not hold water from a biological perspective. Dependency is a fact. It is not a choice or a preference. He goes on to quote some studies that were done at the University of Virginia, and he talks uh, in this study, he, the, I'll just summarize it because it's really long. They show people who are about to be uh, submitted to uh, like an electrical shock. And if they're just by themselves, the stress response is like insane. And if they are holding someone's hand that they don't know, it goes down moderately. And if they're holding the hand of someone that they really love, uh, like a, a, a spouse, it, it's almost in, like there's almost no stress response. And then of the people that they had hold the hands of spouses, those that reported the greatest closeness and intimacy and bondedness with their mates also scored even higher. Anyway, that was the point of the study. And um, he goes on to say this, the dependency paradox. Well before brain imaging technology was developed, John Bowlby understood that our need for someone to share our lives with is part of our genetic makeup and has nothing to do with how much we love ourselves or how fulfilled we feel on our own. He discovered that once we choose someone special, powerful, and often uncontrollable, special, powerful, and often uncontrollable forces come into play. New patterns of behavior kick in regardless of how independent we are and despite our conscious wills. Once we choose a partner, there's no question about whether dependency exists or not. It always does. An elegant coexistence that does not include uncomfortable feelings of vulnerability and fear of loss sounds good, but is not our biology. What, what proved through evolution to have a strong survival advantage is a human couple becoming one physiological unit. It goes on to talk about that for a while. Uh, and then... Paradoxically, the opposite of this is true. It turns out that the ability to step into the world on our own often stems from the knowledge that there is someone beside us who we can count on. This is the dependency 
paradox. The logic is hard to follow at first. How can we act more independent by being thoroughly dependent on someone else? If we had to describe the basic premise of adult attachment in one sense, it would be if you want to take the road to independence and happiness, find the right person to depend on and travel down it with that person. Once you've understand this, you grasp the essence of attachment theory. So anyway, um, I'm not trying to present this as God's truth or anything. I just think it's an interesting set of ideas and propositions that run contrary to so much of the new age um, dogma that at least that I was exposed to coming up in the sort of new age culture of astrology and yoga and, you know, uh, psychedelics and stuff like that, that, that where the goal is so often the goal is about, um, making sure that you're not someone who is dependent on anything other than the wellspring of divinity that's living in your own goddamn heart. <laughs> Oh, do you get what I'm saying though? <laughs> that's it. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's so, and, and it's just, I don't know. It's always, it's never, it's never struck me as like, it's always, always it just feels like, oh, it's a little crazy. <laughs> you know, like, isn't life about relationships? Isn't, it seems a little insane to suggest that we should all be like fully functioning, self-regulating, sovereign, individual, self-sufficient, machines, you know, like marching on to our purpose in eternity. But that's how it, I mean, that's, I don't know. I think that's the new age dogma. It's, and it's a solar dogma. That's the point. It's a, it can be, and not that all Leos are like this or anything, but it can be a solar, a sun-based idea. There is a reason, for example, that the sign of Aries is the exaltation of the sun. And the sign of Leo, another fire sign, the fixed sign of the lion and the, the king that you know, the king stands alone, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the, the king wears a heavy crown. It's lonely. So I don't know. This myth of individuality is it permeates our culture. And I suspect that a Venus retrograde in Leo will force us to tangle pretty deeply with how dependent our strongest sense of individuality and purpose is upon the quality and depth of our relationships. Amen. Just gonna. Like, <laughs> oh, okay. So anyway, five shadows of the sun that I want to talk about today. That I think Venus, especially Venus in Leo, can uh, force us to take a look at while she's retrograde. Number one is the pressure to individuate. And I've been, I've been, you know, we've been. All of these are should not surprise anyone, right? I've sort of already said it all. But the the pressure to individuate is like this. Someone comes into an astrological session. And they say something like, well, you know, and, and all of my problems that, you know, at work or love or money or, you know, health or whatever, it's, it's all just because I, I know that I'm, I'm, I'm needing to evolve and I'm needing to take the next step in my personal evolutionary journey. And once I do, then the karma and all of these areas will get better. And it's, you know, it's like, can I deny that, that, that is, is like a real part of life. It's a real archetypal experience to individuate and for karma to change because we grow as individuals. No, like, of course it's, that's real. It's true. But also like, geez, it's a lot of pressure, especially when people are smoking it like crack all the time. You know what I mean? It's like, like people get so high on this idea that your individuality is going to, you know, deliver you from all of your problems. And the, the shadow, of course, is uh, that, it, well, first of all, the, the simple shadow is disease, right? It, 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 wherever there's a pressure to become, to realize some further potential uh, that rests solely within yourself, right? It's like a vacuum of purpose or something. And there's something about that that is, that is lonely and stressful. Um, and it's, it's like, a, it feels very performative. Like you, it's a perform in your individuality starts to feel like it's a performance and you gotta, you gotta just nail it. You know, it's a lot of pressure. I think Venus retrograde and Leo can relieve us of that pressure by saying, you know what? It's actually the quality of how you love, who you love and the reciprocal nature of what you love, what you get back from what you love, what you, what, how quality of how much you give to what you love that helps you to become more of what you are. You can't do it in a vacuum. And that's number two, the denial of dependency. 
the myth of individuality that is so prevalent with the sun and Leo <clears throat> tends to deny, it thinks of dependency as a dirty word. It is exactly what we read in this section. There's one part in particular I want to go back to because it's just, this is it. Your happiness is something that should come from within and should not be dependent on your lover or mate. What if what if Venus and Venus retrograde in Leo has the audacity to say, uh, no, your happiness comes from your lovers, your mates, your friends. It comes from your relationships. Not that it comes only from the other people in them, but it comes from the depth of your intimacy, your closeness, your sweetness, your generosity, your sense of humor, your playfulness that you share with other people. These are the things that, that bring you happiness as much as any kind of heroic, you know, marching, you know, to the beat of your own drum off to the halls of Nirvana or whatever. It's at least we're thinking about number three is the heroic overcompensation. So <clears throat> the sun is uh, emblematic of uh, the mythology of the hero. It's one. Mars is another one, but there's a reason that Aries, the sign of one of the signs of Mars, is also the exaltation of the sun. They are very closely related. The hero is constantly struggling and overcoming to achieve or accomplish something that is of of noble mission that you've been given. A, you've been tasked with a special purpose. How many times do people come into a reading? I'm not kidding. And they're like, what am I here for? You know, and I'm like, uh, you're here to live a life, you know, in the exploding now. I'm like, what else do you need? Jesus. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and me too. Like, I I get that way too, where I'm like, am I living my purpose? You know, and I'm like, who are you talking to? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so there's there's always room for the hero's journey. It's a huge, it's a hugely important myth. It helps us to overcome struggles. It helps us to define and understand our unique individual gifts. And there is such a thing as purpose and calling. And I don't mean to like laugh or diminish the importance of those things. It's just absurd to me how dominant they become that we can't ever set them aside and imagine that today can be a day without a purpose. This life can be a life that has elements of purpose but it's not uh, bound and confined by some uh, moral purpose imperative, you know? How can we live with a lighter, like holding the notion of purpose a little bit lighter? Not everything in life has to be about the heroic need to overcome and, and you know, struggle on until we reach some goal morally, spiritually, and, you know, on any level. <clears throat> the opposite is the opposite idea is that a life can be lived for nothing other than the sake of pleasure. And we don't mean cheap, hedonistic, we mean the pleasure of love, the pleasure of relating to a life, a, a universe just teeming with life. Like, it's so funny to me how bored people get in such a magical universe. And I think some of the boredom comes from a lack of imagination and the lack of imagination comes from a lack of relatedness. When you start relating to things, you start imagining. And when you start imagining, you start loving. This comes back to the quote we read from James Hillman the other day, to imagine is to love and to love is to imagine. I see people like, frequently in, you know, in my practice struggling um, with this feeling that I have to be a better, a better parent. You know, I got to be better spiritually. I'm not very good at meditation. I've got to be better with my diet. I got to be better with my body. And um, I don't hear people as much saying, I've got to have more fun. I've got to, I've got to spend more time with the people I love. I have to find more ways of laughing with the, the people that are special to me. Got to find more time to be in community with people that I like. I got to find more time to do things that bring me smiles and laughter and make me feel creatively satisfied, even if it's just for a few hours. I don't ever hear people 
with a sense of impending doom. If, you know, it's like, if I don't, I know I've got to do these. It's there's, oh, there's such a weightiness with the sun and the heroic journey. Anyway, uh, number four is the impossible standards of success. The sun is like a platonic. It, it's, you know, in the allegory of the cave, when the prisoner escapes, Plato's prisoner escapes the cave and sees the light of the sun illuminating the real world, the higher, the world of higher forms. It gives us a real, a glimpse into what the sun is like. The sun was called daimon by ancient astrologers. And Vettius Valen said that the daimon would present humans with ideal images, like a platonic image of something and stir them up with ambition to undertake a life or actions that would be in pursuit of that ideal image. Um, we, it is absolutely beautiful to live a life stirred up by our diamonds with a sense of purpose, with ambition, with ideals that call to us, like they shimmer like gold. Um, but it's also really important that we understand that um, it's the, you know, it's such a cliche, but it's the journey, not the destination that, that this world is, is frequently going to disappoint us when it comes to meeting the gold standard of the sun. <clears throat> that, that this world is, um, well, there's a way that the alchemist said that you can't get to gold until you've gone through silver. And I think what that means, and I heard James Hillman say this in an essay once, was basically that you can't get to whatever alchemical gold is, whatever the ideal is. You, you can't get there until you have learned to look at the world um, in, its, in, the, in the light of the moon, which means to look at the world as a reflection of something beautiful and, and transcendent, yet right here, spread before us. It's like until you can learn to see heaven in the grain of a, a mustard seed, you're not getting to alchemical gold. And I think we skip that part of the process. You know, it's like we have to learn how to see all of the little nooks and crannies and all of the little imperfections and flaws and faults and farts. <laughs> you know, we have to learn to see them with um, with divine eyes. The, the world just the way it is, our life just the way it is, who I am today just the way that I am. And in, in that sort of silvering of our consciousness, we make it possible to shape our lives into something resembling gold, but not, in, not if we skip over uh, somehow seeing the divinity in the here and now, in the, the, the imminent, that which is embodied in here. So I wonder when it comes to Venus's retrograde in Leo, not just about relationships and dependency. But in general, I wonder about making peace with the way that things are um, and, and coming to accept and fall in love with the way that things are and, and rather than obsessing about how to take something from the way that it is to some perfect gold standard. So something in this Venus retrograde says, can you just love things the way that they are, even if they have somehow fallen short of the gold standard? I think that one of the easiest ways to do that, just sort of overall, you know, as individuals who are met with our failures, our shortcomings, or the imperfections of the world, where is it that we find relief from that, that failure or shortcoming? It's in relationships. At the end of the day, I failed as an astrologer. I didn't make a video I liked. I'm not, you know, I'm not hitting the mark or whatever. I sit down, I talk to a friend, I talk to my wife, I spend time with my kids. I, I talk to a family member. I connect with someone in the heart. And it's like the heart to heart connections that we have, even if your heart to heart connection is with something more abstract, like your guitar or nature or poetry or whatever. When you connect with something, it's that connecting that somehow just pulls in all the imperfections and all of the falling short, and it just brings it right through the river of the heart, and it says, yes, it's all okay. And somehow this place where we've fallen short is golden. 
We can't get there unless we have some way of inviting failure, disappointment, uh, shortcomings. We have to make peace with failure before we find real gold. And I think for us, so much of that pressure to find real gold exists in the myth of individuality. You have to do it on your own. It's something you find within yourself. Ah, I don't know. I think it's when our individuality fails and we have to come back to the things that really matter, which are our relationships. And never put us under the pressure of perfecting anything. They're so ready to say yes to just the way you are. Number five is the inflation of purpose. So we already talked about this, but just the idea that what does it look like to live a life that is ruled by Venus's interests, not the sun's? Or that Venus gets to redirect our life purpose or our interests in terms of her desires and her interests. Chief among them would be play, would be erotics, would be art, would be relationship, would be love, creativity, and not for the sake of anything other than the sensual experience and feeling that comes with it, the joy and happiness, the way our five senses engage and appreciate. It is, it is really helpful from time to time to just let go of purpose and trade it in for beauty, you know? easy to find beauty when that's your goal. Uh, it's harder to feel like you've fulfilled some sense of purpose. Now I say all of this as a person who um, takes a lot of, um, I take a lot of joy in the discovery of purpose and the pursuit of purpose. I think it's a real archetype, but boy, is it, it's just sort of, it's just gone berserk at times, right? So it'll be interesting to see how Venus plays and riffs on those themes. Well, before we close, I want to remind you to use the promo code AC10ADAM at astrologyhub.com uh, if you want to uh, get 15% off from one of their readings, which I think would be um, a great idea. Let me just, I want to take you back over to, uh, let me just take you back over to their website and show you how you can do that. I'm not sure if I put the promo code up at the beginning or not. So, so here is the website once more. If you want to check out their service, you go to astrologyhub.com and go to the readings tab. And when you book, use the promo code AC10 Adam to get 15% off. And you can use that up until the end of July. And I'll feature that the rest of this week as well. And we'll make sure to share that with you guys and remind you of it. It'll be in the comment section, uh, description of this video and all, all of that good stuff. All right. Well, thanks for listening today and we will see you again tomorrow. Take it easy. Everybody.